hello to all of you uh, for a, a second, third, or hundredth time that we've met and spoken about uh, student achievement and student performance. And I'm very happy that uh, Julie just noted that about some of the you know, technical glitches that have occurred as, as, you, as some of your schools have uploaded data. The system you just saw, Epicenter, has been in development for, I think they mentioned 12 years now. So it's been a lot, there's been a lot of continuous improvement. It is, where it is today is vast, vastly beyond where it was when it was developed 12 years ago. Elevate 360 is six months old. So it is, it's new and that's okay. It's, it, we're very pleased with how far we've taken it and we're looking forward to feedback from users to continually improve it. We already have a target date of, I believe it's February, for an internal release of what we're calling 2.0, and hopefully in time for your spring results to have a new and improved version already. We're, it's part of uh, where we, how we do things in National Charter Schools Institute, like you as school leaders, we're in a mode of continuous improvement. So this is what I'm gonna cover with you today. Why are we using Elevate 360? What is Elevate 360, and how do we use Elevate 360? And then I'm going to answer any questions you may have. What you saw was a live demo of Epicenter. You won't see a live demo today, and as was mentioned back there, we don't do the loading, you as school leaders. Uh, and so similar to Epicenter, we'll have follow-up to these, this presentation for the people in your schools who are actually doing the loading of data, because that's one of the key. If you, if you can't get the data in, you'll never get anything out of it. So we will follow up with uh, live webinars that uh, people can attend virtually. So one of the reasons we're doing that is to respect the use of their time. We know, you know, just coming up here for a day is a, is a tremendous commitment of time from you. So we're going to try and do as much as we can virtually. Now I want to, before we get to any of this, I want to go back because how many in the room are school leaders, principals, uh, leader, leadership positions in schools? Okay, most of you. Good. I, I am going to try and tie this together because it really does come down to leadership, what I'm going to share with you today, and, and leading for change, leading in times of change, we're going to talk about that a little, there is a change, there's a change in terms of the way uh, the compliance of your schools is being monitored and measured, and also this is going to represent a change in the way the performance of the schools you lead is being monitored. And about a year and a half ago, a little more than a year and a half ago, I was asked to review a charter application. I, when I'm not doing my regular day job, I actually do that for fun. I like, believe it or not, they're very big, thick documents, but I love reviewing charter applications. And there was one that there was sort of a rush job in New York uh, where they had a situation. There was a school called Harlem Day School, and it was the lowest performing school in New York City. It was a charter school, not the lowest performing charter school, the lowest performing school in New York City. It's been around for 10 years, really struggling. Har Harlem Day School. Great people, great intentions. Ten years along, they, you know, they weren't executing for students. Their authorizer didn't want to close them down. They closed down schools and they'd seen how that disrupted the lives of students. And the leadership of the authorizer together with the leadership of the school said, let's do it differently. Let's see if we can bring in uh, new management, essentially, new operators to take the same students and do things differently. But we've got to do it really quickly. This was approximately April, I believe. And they needed something for the, for the fall. So, uh, long story short, they, I was one of two people who reviewed the application. The, the group, they, they put an RFP out, and that request for proposal uh, got, I think, a total of one. One operator was interested in doing a turnaround of the lowest performing school. You can imagine, turnarounds, right? Toughest thing to do. Uh, who wants to take on all those, whatever they were, issues that were in that school? One operator came in and in three weeks prepared a 700-page application. I had the pleasure with another person to review that application, and believe it or not, in three weeks they put together enough that I gave it not, you know, if I had more than two thumbs, I would have given it more than two thumbs up. I read it, and I was convinced that on paper, and doing my due diligence, this looked like a good opportunity. It was something that was going to have a strong potential to uh, execute for students, and, and or, you know, perform for students. That's a year and a half ago. They had one full year of uh, operation, 11 and 2011-12. Uh, they're now, and believe me, I don't believe it, I have to do more due diligence. I heard last week they're now ranked in the 96th percentile of schools in New York City after one year. One year. It's called Harlem Prep. Go on, look at the data. One of the reasons is because growth, the, the method of evaluating schools in New York City is by weighting growth very heavily. And they took some very low-performing students and uh, achieved tremendous growth. 
They also had, at the time I reviewed the application, three or four schools already operating successfully. That's part of my due diligence and why I felt good about it. And they had really incredibly strong emphasis on leadership and the leadership pipeline that they would bring into this new school. By the end of last year, they had seven schools. This year, they have seven schools. And I'm going to tell you guys more of the story in a moment. They're called Harlem Prep. And I also want to tie this to the fact that for the next half hour, I'm going to talk about test scores and accountability and things that are extremely important in the lives of charter schools. I also understand, and as you'll see, there's a lot more. You know this. There's a lot more to education than test scores. There's a whole lot that goes on in a school. This particular school, Harlem Prep, uh, they had one of the things they did change in the school was the teaching staff. They kept five or 50 teachers that were working in the school. One of them was the music teacher. And they showed this video of the fourth graders at Harlem Prep to me about a week ago. They, they made this, they produced it on October 15th. A week ago it had 100,000 views. I looked at it today, I think 250,000 views on YouTube. So try not to sing along. That's your challenge right now. Let's see what happens. <laughs> generic prep, we're democracy prep, so that's part of the reason for the, uh, for the focus on, on voting and civics and so on. And you know, those kids can't vote, 
But uh, how many of those do you think will be voting when they finally get the chance? I think you know there's, there's still an incredibly important lesson there through that. Uh, they've got a grant to replicate their model, and they've said they're spending the entire amount. They had great latitude on how they could spend their it's nine million dollars that they just were awarded to expand their program and replicate. The entire amount is on building their leadership pipeline. So coming back to you, it's about the leadership in the schools that's incredibly important in achieving that kind of change. So, back to performance. Why change now uh, to something like Elevate 360? Has anyone heard of Public Act 277? Anyone in the room? One person must have heard of it. I see a, I see a hand up in the back there. What's Public Act 277? You, you talk about it. Oh, I'd love to hear from someone. You're going to hear lots of my voice. I think Maria out here knows me. Pardon? Go ahead. Anyone else? Public Act 277? A lot of new requirements. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's the new law that uh, really determines how charters are authorized and, and evaluated in the state of Michigan. And one very important piece of that act is this. Authorizer decisions related to contract renewal must include increases in academic achievement for all groups of pupils as the most important factor. You might have thought, well, wasn't that always the case? It, it wasn't written into law. Your charters will be evaluated, and the renewal will, the most important factor in the renewal is uh, academic achievement. And I'll come back to some, another piece of that language in a bit. There's something else changing uh, that you're all familiar with. Maybe I'll think of another. So that was a state change. What's a big change on the national scene? Common Core. Exactly. It's essentially raised the bar for what's expected for students. And it expects uh, teaching and learning to occur dif differently. And as leaders, if you're not working on successfully implementing those new requirements that the Common Core represent, uh, I can almost tell you almost certain things not going to be successful in your school when you have the new assessments that are uh, related to it. So two very big things. A big change in the way uh, charters are overseen in the state and uh, has been put into law and the Common Core. And uh, are you ready to lead in a period of change? Some new guidance out from ASCD. Again, if you're not getting, I heard Bay Mills is going to do some training on Common Core. That's great. Go and absorb it. Get it. Get your staff trained. There's a whole lot involved, and I would recommend. Uh, I've got no stock in ASD. The, uh, are you all familiar with ASCD, Educational Leadership? Those resources. Some really good pieces to help you uh, lead in this time of change. So, questions for you: Are newly enrolled students performing at grade level in your school? Is that the case? They all come in and they're right at grade level. No. No. Okay. You got one or two, right? That are a little bit maybe below. That's pretty common, I think. <laughs> lots, lots. Okay, lots. How long should it take to get a student to grade level? And let me just stop there. Grade level. What's what's the proxy for grade level? Any pro? Anybody? How, throw out a guess. I'm going to pick on a, an old college. Jim, what's grade level? What's grade level? Uh, well, what do you mean, what's grade level? When, we, when I say is a student at grade level, how would you measure that? Well, what kind of, if you were using an assessment like performance series or NWEA, what kind of number would you look to say that that student's at grade level? Let's go with a number. Okay, give so you a hand. I'm more familiar with secondary, so I would, okay. I would kind of look at the E-pass. The E-pass. All right. That, uh, yeah. Well, let's take a look. You heard about 21. Pat Shannon mentioned 21. There's another number that goes with 21 for the nation. Does anybody know what 21 represents nationally? College ready. College ready. It's the 50th percentile. All right. Grade level, a proxy for grade level is often the 50th percentile. That's, is that perfect? No. It's a very, and I'm not surprised there weren't a lot of responses. It's a difficult concept and there's not always agreement on what determines grade level. But there's general agreement if a student's performing at or above the 50th percentile, they can be considered at grade level. Now, is grade level good enough for what we need going forward? Okay, I see he has shaping, and we don't need to discuss that at any grade length. Um, 
it's not it's, it's not a bad bar to get up to if that's if you're not up at grade level. But everything we know that just being at grade level to be really well prepared for college for the workplace is not necessarily enough, particularly as you go higher in uh, the grades. So this is something I want you to ask yourself. Uh, we're not going to answer it today. Uh, but at your school, if you're a middle school, are they ready for a rigorous high school program with the new Michigan America curriculum and the Common Core State Standards? If you're running a high school, are they ready to succeed in a, in a post-secondary uh, situation? Are they ready for the workplace, whatever they were preparing for themselves for? If they're not, I strongly recommend as leaders you have those discussions internally. <laughs> so, again, we know that what you do in your schools is a more, much more than, rep than you can represent in a test score. You could have a performing arts program, you could have an environmental science program, you could have a leadership program, you could have a sports program, you could have all of the above and more. That's incredibly important in the lives of your students. We do know that this thing right here is the national uh, ACT average, so it's the 50th percentile. We also know that when you break it down into subject area scores, math, English, reading, science, if students perform at those subject area scores, they have a 75% chance or better to get a passing grade in a first year credit bearing course in college. If you, don't, uh, if you don't have that, if you're not ready, what we, and I worked for CMU for 10 years and they didn't like to advertise this a lot, there's a whole industry in remediation. And many, many students come not prepared, not ready to take credit bearing courses. They use up very valuable and scarce uh, uh, student loans and resources that are available to them on courses that aren't credit bearing. And, they, and I think CMU has approximately 50% of students who start as undergraduates actually complete. And other institutions are quite a bit lower. So there's a real crisis out there in terms of having students at least at this level. And the other research that's been very clear, uh, and our students in Michigan uh, take something called the work keys as part of their Michigan Merit exam. If they're not at that level, they're not also prepared for the 21st century workplace. So we can have a long discussion about being college ready, how important is it that all students are prepared for college, I think it's an excellent discussion to have. That is representative of more than college ready. I would say college and workplace ready. We often say college, work, and life. So that's where this all started, the tool that we're going to look at in a moment, was understanding that if a student isn't on this trajectory, let me go to the next one, it's a little easier to see. If they're not on that trajectory, it's very, if, say they're down here, it's really hard to get up there. And you're more likely to, to be, if you're on the trajectory or above, to stay on it. All the research shows that if you're down here, and if I go back a slide, uh, you act, whoops, sorry. This is not particularly representative. It's very common that students actually veer off and drop out if they're not performing. And you know that if, if they're not performing. You know that already at grade eight. Uh, with something called the Explore Test that I believe all the schools uh, that Bay Mills authorizes are using. So, is it everything? No, but it's a very, very good indicator. So what uh, Central Michigan University did in cooperation with the National Charter Schools Institute was develop this backward mapping model. So they took these numbers that ACT produced using huge large-scale research. These are the college readiness benchmarks, and this is just illustrative. This is just one subject. I think it might be reading. Uh, and we backward mapped it using real data all the way to grade two. So that you know, beginning in grade two, whether or not a student's on that trajectory in those two key subjects, math and reading. And if they're not, this tool won't help you. If they're not, then you go back to what you know how to do as educators. Use your data, use the performance series, use the skills connection, use Descartes, uh, explore, plan, ePass has a great, a great uh, number of resources you can use. What you do know is that they're not on that trajectory, that's, should, you should be concerned uh, about you know, how well you're preparing them for the next uh, part of their life. And if they are, they're, they're, hopefully they'll uh, be able to keep up. So, Elevate 360, that's the purpose. I won't read it, I'll let you read it. Yeah. 
it is at this point, Elevate 360 is a tool for Bay Mills to use, but just like Epicenter, it wouldn't be very successful if only Bay Mills was looking at that computer screen and looking at the compliance. It's got to be interactive with the schools. And it's gotten to the point where Epicenter has become a very useful management tool for the, at the school level, where they can help ensure their compliance is always where it needs to be. And that's where we're going to take Elevate 360 as well. It's currently very useful for this purpose, Elevate 360, and we're going to continue to build it to make it more and more helpful at the school level. It reports on two things, primarily. There's a lot, of, I'll show you a number of reports and there's dozens in there, but I'm going to show you two right now. Achievement of continuously enrolled students. And that's currently defined as students enrolled in a school for three or more years. Really important concept. You all nodded your head when I said students, uh, there's a, a few students in your school who come in below level. They aren't where you want them to be, where their parents want them to be, where we all want them to be. And there's general agreement that if the student's been with you for three or more years, that you're responsible if they aren't. Think, I always go back to a second grader. If you met a student for kindergarten, they started with you day one or somewhere in kindergarten, they were with you for first grade and for all of second grade. By the sp spring of second grade, I as a school leader, as a teacher, would feel very responsible if that student's not at least at grade level. And I think your board members, if you discuss that with your board members, I, I think you'll get strong agreement there. And you can take that all the way through. If you're a high school, uh, taking the ACT at the end of grade 11, it's a little harder than in second grade. But if you've got students who you had for 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, if they're, if, they, if they're not at 21 average, you know, what, you know what, what can we do? Do we have another year? It's, it is much harder. I'm pointing at Jim. Jim's worked in high schools and... High schools that serve uh, a lot of alternative education uh, students. And it is a, it's a tough proposition to get students up to 21. You're only getting them in grade 9. Um, but it can be done. It can be done, and uh, it's, been, it's been shown in a few places. So then, when we're talking about 3 plus year students, we often get the feedback, well, what about the other kids? Absolutely. The growth of all students. Fall to spring in 2nd through 8th grade, and spring to spring in 8th through 11th grade. All students should be growing at a rate that will get them up to that trajectory. So those are the two main things that you'll see in Elevate 360. There's a lot of reports, I'll show you a few of them, but those are the two of the main things. Any questions? I'm gonna get some pictures in a minute. Could you do two years? Could you do two years and three years? Great question, yes. You can do slice and dice a lot. So let me get there. <laughs> Actually, that's the next question. Should any cohorts for accountability be added? So you just mentioned other coronal, I, we talked about the cohort of continuously enrolled students. You talked about a cohort of two year, one year, how about newly enrolled, when you want to know your baseline? What up, yes? One question. Would it be the responsibility of the schools and or management company or the responsibility of the authorizer to speak with Scantron about changing those skill scores that, so that it can align with its more benchmarks and more targets? That's a good question. And essentially what you'll see here, I can go back that trajectory that I showed you, they're correlated. So they are actually already, that's the work that, and they are doing more work in them. There was this past summer, both NWEA and Performance Series came out with new research that uh, better correlates the scale scores to the Explore plan. But if you go back, I'll go all the way back, whoops. I don't want to show you this stuff yet, hold on. <laughs> we'll get there. So that's exactly what this is. We actually, when we did that research, you see there, that's uh, a 3,012 <coughs> performance series, a 2000, uh, 227 on the RIT scale, and a 16 on the Explore. And that, that was a group of approximately 2,000 students that took each test in the same test window. And that's how we came up with, with those, that, that link between these scales and this scale. And there's, again, there's a whole white paper that even the state of Michigan looked at and submitted as part of its uh, Race to the Top application. And that's why they didn't get Race to the Top. They really did like the... So there's a whole long description, a technical white paper, if you're interested, describing what's called the derivation of college writing in the benchmark. So, so basically, right now, students that are testing in uh, Spanchon, <coughs> their scores will be a lot lower compared to last year because the benchmark is higher. 
Mm, you know, their score, their scale score won't change. Okay. Their scale but, score. But but where they fall in their um, their range, like little average proficiency bands. Thank you. Are you talking about those colored bands? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Those colored bands are actually customizable by Julia. You no, know, well, you they're actually here because you. That's what I'm asking. Right. You, you, as an individual, at Bay Mills, your individual customers, you can customize those bands. There's actually an administrative tool within Performance Series, and that's an excellent idea, to customize them relative to uh, these. Absolutely, yeah. So, all right, that was a good question. And please do stop me. Questions there? Any questions? So we were here, cohorts, other chronological cohorts, Remember that language in the new law, in Public Act 277, that said your uh, authorizers shall uh, consider as the most important factor academic achievement? There was a little phrase in there. It didn't just say academic achievement. It said something else. It said it's all groups of pupils. And that has yet to be defined, but it's assumed that all groups will be defined as the traditional subgroups that you're all familiar with for No Child Left Behind. So I'll tell you how this is going to help you with that as well. So I, I would say that and not just chronological cohorts, but other subgroups uh, would be an important piece to look at. All right. So I mentioned that uh, there's a lot of reports in here. I'm only going to take you through a small handful of the reports. And you can't read this, but I'm going to do a little bit of it for you. So it just happens to be at Bay Mills Authorized Schools, Taylor Exemplar. There's Taylor over there. Uh, this is something called the trajectory report. So that should look familiar. That's essentially that curve we were just looking at. Uh, it's, it's more illustrative than anything else. It's not precise, but it does, it does represent that curve. Uh, it's last school year. It's grades 2 through 8. It's the fall assessment. I'm going to tell you why the fall is important in a moment. It's reading, and it's newly enrolled. So down here, right now, you can pull down that drop-down menu and pick newly enrolled students, Students have been enrolled for one year, two year, or three plus. Those are the four, or all students. So five different uh, slicing and dicing of cohorts. So what this, think about it, this is the fall, and these are newly enrolled students. Any other word for that? Thank you, I heard it over there, baseline. This is the raw material coming into Taylor Exemplar Academy. I'm not gonna get into the details at this very moment about what the colors and the lines mean, I will in a moment. But I think you can guess, if they're below the line, if they're red, you're absolutely certain. They're not, uh, and you can see when the, when the whisker crosses, they become yellow. So you've got some, certain, you've got some sense that they may be college ready, but you're not absolutely certain. Uh, so that's the raw material coming into Taylor Exemplar. Those are the students that are coming in. This, are, this is actually real data. If you go onto your site, you'll see this. And when you're on the site, you can actually also hover over this and see an end size, the standard error of the uh, effect size. You can see a lot of other information. Now, if you look again in the spring, and you look at uh, what you're being held accountable for, which is the students enrolled three or more years, you'd hope to see a different picture, right? And when I was looking through all your sites, it looked real good, Taylor. So there you go. That's Taylor students who've been enrolled in Taylor uh, Exemplar Academy for three or more years. Without exception, they are deemed to be on track. The yellow ones, it's not complete certainty because you always have to look at things in a range. When they're blue, that means you're absolutely certain you're second or third, I think it's third, fourth, third, second, third, and fifth graders. With absolute certainty, that cohort of students is performing at a level when you look at the cohort as a total and college writing as well. So that's an important report. Growth. So you're looking at cohorts, but you also want to look at all your students. And this is where it's going to get really a little bit more complicated. And there's something called effect size. And actually, you guys can help me out and end up that. And put about, I don't think I have enough for everyone. You put five at every table and you'll have to share. So, the middle line here, and here I'll go down, to, it's Taylor again, it's a summary report. So this is now, this is the current year, you can't see it, it says 11-12, or the most recent year, 10-11, 9-10, and it says all students. So growth is, should always be looked at for all students. 
So you've got a three year uh, range that we only have three years of data loaded. Uh, it's a summary report, which means this represents all of the students in second through eighth grade and their growth from fall to spring, because it should say that here somewhere too, fall to spring growth. You can actually look at fall to winter growth. If you're, if you're testing three times a year, there's an option to look at fall to winter growth. Reading and all students. So what does this mean? It says growth target, but I need you to know that that's not a hard target in the sense of one of those numbers. To go above and beyond, because this information is going to be used to make high-stakes decisions. The model was built using a complex algorithm that reports out in something called effect size. And I'll come back to that once you all have those pieces of paper handed out to you. But again, with Taylor, what you can see, without exception, uh, they're doing well. Now, it's interesting that when, sometimes when we talk about averages or aggregating data, we use the, the analogy of having one foot in boiling water and the other foot in ice water. On average, you're doing just fine. But in reality, there's a problem somewhere. So, but I don't want to, again, I, I really, I don't, I'm not picking on Taylor, the results still look good, but you can see if you start looking at the grade level, that there's tremendous growth in grade two. In fact, it's good growth all the way through, but in middle school, there's some times where the growth probably isn't where they want it to be. But in actually all cases, they're yellow at least, which is good. Yellow's good, green's really good, and you, uh, in this case, it's red, and the other one is you'll uh, see that's where you really want to pinpoint. So this is a grade level uh, with three years of data. Any questions yet? So this is, and it's being reported in something called effect size. Magic, right? It's just sprinkle some dust on the numbers and it works. It's actually not magic. It's psychometrics. <laughs> and I'm out that I used to when I, I some of you have been in presentations. I used to call these guys psychomagicians uh, because I I'm not a psychomagician. I you know my training is as a school, as a school administrator. I'm going to try and help a little bit with it, but we will provide be providing you with much more uh, in terms of resources, just like the one I handed out to you. So Elevate 360. There's the inputs which starts with the Michigan Student Data System and all the different tests that we can currently put in, that gets pushed through something called an algorithm, which is what the psychometricians developed to measure both growth and achievement towards the college readiness standards. And then you get the outputs. And the outputs are all on the same scale. And that's one of the reasons this thing called effect size was used. You can then, when you use effect size, you can compare different tests, different schools, different grades, and it really does allow for a much better apples to apples comparison. Important at the authorizer, very important at the authorizer level. Less so at the school level or grade level. All right, these were supposed to come out one by one. I've just answered all my own questions. <laughs> First one is, what is the most popular series of books ed educators have been using to improve practice over the past 10 years? I'm, I, is there anybody in the room who's not heard of Robert Marzano? Probably not. You know, it's, it's amazing how much impact he and his series of books have had uh, across the educational world. If you go all the way back to 2003, the first one was called What Works in Schools. And that's actually based on meta-research that he did for almost a decade prior to that in terms of uh, effective strategies and so on. And one of the most commonly used indices of the impact of school-level factors on student achievement is the effect size. And you go back to Marzano's research, and it's classroom strategies and school-level factors. He'll report out on what's most effective or most by using something called the effect size. So it's a good, robust, well-accepted metric. It's not that easy to understand. And that's why we're developing things. If you take a look on the back side of that paper I handed out, this is the best we could do so far. We're looking for input on how to help people understand the idea of effect size. So, you're all familiar with this, the normal curve. There you could even discuss whether or not things are normally distributed in education uh, in terms of achievement. But assuming they are, um, effect size is very similar to these things that you might be familiar with down here. Z-scores, if you read the methodology used for the top to bottom list, you'll know that uh, Z-scores are very much uh, part of your life. And Effect sizes are very similar, where it's a way of standardizing uh, 
the reporting or the measurement of, of something. And we, here you see the same colors. An effect size of zero is actually a good thing. But you're not absolutely certain it's good unless you're having a positive effect. And the stronger the positive, the larger the positive number, the stronger the effect. And vice versa. So when you go back and look at your reports, and you don't want negative numbers. You don't want to have a negative effect on student achievement. It should be fairly clear. I hope you don't have any questions now about effects. Yeah. But we do. I have a question, honestly, about the, the Common Core and the test itself, the test I do. Because we start the Common Core this year, language art and math in our school. And I noticed when they did the, 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 the fall, honestly, they, they improved from like the, the spring field. So how the test item, how far they are aligned to what we are teaching at Common Core? Right. And if you add, if I represented either uh, NWEA or performance series, I would give you the salesman. Salesman, oh yeah, our tell, our Ida banks are the best. They are, you know, they're aligned. The reports are, you know, giving you the best feedback you could want. You have to be cautious. You have to be a cautious consumer. They're not perfectly aligned, and that's why I led this off by saying you should all be uh, immersing yourselves in what's going to be required for teaching and learning. Uh, in alignment with Common Core State Standards and how they will be assessed through, in Michigan it's called the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. It's not the same as the way they're assessing. Uh, honestly, I've been, I, I'm involved, it's so much right. different. And, but you don't have anything yet other than these assessments. No, but the sample of the question of the Smart Balance, I think we saw the samples so right. they are on any website. It's far away from the NWA or right. the program. And so what you'll see these companies do to remain meaningful in the era of PARC and Smarter Balance is improve their item bank. It doesn't mean that the information you're getting back from NWA or, or Scantron is any it's less aligned. Yeah. You're right. Too. But, but if I'm teaching for informational text, let's say that's mm -hmm. really good. But and NWA doesn't give so much weight for that thing. That's what... You're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. So you need, you need to understand that and you need to know how to adjust your instruction accordingly. One of the things, this, you know, this, you've been using Performance Series or NWA for a number of years. It's one of the good things about this, uh, these two assessments, is they remain consistent and they give you valuable information. Smarter Balance is coming in 2015, and we still don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I think next week might even have the election might have an impact on it. And something we do know about state and federal initiatives in education is they will change. Things will change in the assessment. Think about meat over the last 10 years. How many times has changed? Grade levels, cuts, you know, all those changes. I think we can be almost entirely certain that we'll see that as Smarter Balanced is implemented. Less so because it's 30 states. So this is, a, I would, as a, as a school leader, I, in terms of are my students reaching a level that will prepare them for college work and life, you can still rely on this. And you should continue to rely on this, I would say. Mark, why I'm not here, honestly, because my teacher asked me, NWA is full through, it's very important for the evaluation now, they call the teacher evaluation, right. the percent of this. If my teacher teaches common core and the test will not give this valid result, then how clear I am to those steps? You know, that's why I'm saying as, right. as, as, as a principal to evaluate or as a management company, I would like to put the weight for their evaluation, 50% of their contract to come back or not come back, rely on this test. If I teach it in the class and then testing something out of the class, we go again right. for another uh, moral values. I would say you're absolutely right, and that's why you can't do enough in terms of immersing yourself and understanding the common core and how that relates to what you're doing now and how you need to change things. Yeah. You will continue to be held accountable used by your authorizer using this, and I think that's a good practice for authorizers because we, a, we don't even know if it's for certain going to be there in 2015, the Smarter Balance. That's still a couple of years away. They have a job to do. You have a job to do. It'll uh, then it's at least 2016 before you see growth. So, again, rely on this. I understand your question exactly, and and it's it's a challenge. It's, a, it's frankly it's a challenge of leadership to be ready for that implementation of balance that all out. It's a good question. All right. So. These are the details that I want to walk you through right now in terms of just loading data. It's very, I would say it's very simple in its conception. 
There can be some challenges, I understand, if you actually have a file on your desktop and you try and get it into the system. We'll work through it, you know, I've worked through it with some of you, and Megan has worked through it with some of you. It starts simply by adding a user. And when a user's added, they get an email. And Julie, where's Julie? Julie, you're currently doing all the user adding. Right. We have an added right now as a tool administrator, except for email. Right. So Julie adds you. If you need a, an, an additional person, you can go through Julie to get an additional person added at your school site or removed. Uh, and you're, there's, there's either a portfolio owner or a school administrator. Again, this is still at the rudimentary stages, and that will be one of the things that's uh, improved. So and again, one of the key things to know is that if you're using this, you should be familiar with FERPA regulations. And so it essentially forces you to read them before you then there's a part of the tool that says view goals. And that over here, I haven't expanded it. I think, believe it only has ACT and the subject. So if you expanded all those, you would see all the fall, winter, and spring in each of the uh, testing areas, either performance series or NWA. It's essentially a static report, but if you're interested in the hard targets, the numbers you should be looking for in one of the tests, that's in the system for you. And those are, again, they're hard targets. They're, it's not uh, customizable right now, uh, and not at your level, but if somebody's interested, what are those college readiness targets we're looking for? They're all listed in there. Then you load your data. Should be easy. It should be, it, it was designed to be very simple, simply doing this. You, uh, you select a test type, you would select NWEA, you go on your desktop, just like attaching a file, and you click Save. That's all there is to loading data. In a perfect world, it would work just magically every time. It's all, you click Save, you've got your three assessments, six assessments up for the year. To be very frank, most of the issues are with the, not with the system, but with the data files you're loading. So if you're trying to load a spring 2011, performance series file, it was actually a winter one. It will still accept it if you didn't label it. So there, you know, there's issues like that. If you haven't used uh, UICs, and there's a number of different things. Dates of birth can get in the way, because they have to be able to match students. Um, so the theory is good. The practice is a little more difficult. And Megan, myself, Julie, we're here to work with you and uh, work through that. And we're continually improving it. For some of you, it was actually seamless. You clicked, or someone in your school clicked, uploaded files, it was all in there, displayed perfectly. Wasn't the case across the board. We know that, and we're, we're going to keep working with you on it. As you see, it says, load the MSDS file first. So you all have a Michigan Student Data System file coming out this month. That will be the first activity in uh, this month, in November. Do we, do we have, to, do you have the date off the top of your head, Julie? November 20. 14, a certified Michigan student data system file, and there's somebody in your school who's been sent a clear list of instructions of exactly how to access the file, the format it has to be in, and how to upload it. And we will do, as, uh, as Megan mentioned, we'll be doing webinars in the month of November to uh, train people online. All right, so you've got all your data loaded, and if you're a high school, uh, you, this is an example of a explore, well it says uh, EPASS summary. So this is Explore, well, this could be a school that has um, all of Explore Plan and ACT loaded. And you can see you know, a trend over three years. This happens to be all students, it's achievement. And so again, it's just another example of how it looks at high school. Slightly different to elementary school. Is that the improvement from Explore to Plan to ACT? To no, this, it doesn't show you that in this, it would have been a growth one. This is actually just showing you, so for example, this is English, it's over a period of three years, it's all students, so this year, all students in English were, and actually you can see, over three years there wasn't much change, they were all college ready every year. In 
and it says it's uh, ETAS summary, which means all the grades that took Explore, Plan, and ACT. You can then drill down. And look, this, you look here, and you can drill down to just grade 8, or just grade 9, or just grade 10 plan. But this is a summary, so it's all the grades that took those assessments. The question about they're not the same student because they, yeah, that's what. right. These are achievement is always a snapshot in time, so it's not showing you the growth. When you do look at so if, if here we had selected uh, where it says achieve, if you selected growth, then the growth measure is of matched pairs of students from fall to spring, or an e-pass it would be from spring to spring, uh, and their growth. So it is the same students when it's growth. All right. Questions? I find it extremely informative, so we love that. And what you suggest clearly, it's evident, uh, it's beneficial to monitor based on assessment, which is perhaps three times a year, but not uh, on a monthly. <coughs> To complement what we do internally, do you have any suggestion as to how we could maximize the use of such tool? Sure. Um, basically, as I mentioned right at the beginning, currently it's built as an authorizer tool. It is not the tool that you're going to use to drive academic achievement at the individual student level or even at the classroom level or teacher level. What you do there is, uh, Restom, is going to be different from what they do at another school. And that's something for you to discuss with Bay Mills. You know, as an educator, my recommendation is a, what's called a balanced assessment system. You want to have everything from the most uh, meaningful formative assessment with a teacher and an individual student that is not based on numbers, but it might be a you know, checkout at the end of the uh, class, all the way through interim benchmark assessments to the summative assessments. And ideally, that entire balanced assessment system is aligned. But again, it's, not, it's going to look somewhat different in each of the schools. So, and it's a, that's certainly a longer conversation than we could spend Mark, today. Mark, yeah. it's, but I just would like to add, there are so many reports, as Mark said, that can take your data in a like class by students and things like that. So there are some reports you can generate to take you up to like group the student appreciation for instruction until the spring when you test another time and you want to have the cross. Let me go. Let me go. We have the internal. What I love about it is it's an external tool that the authorizer is proposing that give us even a different dimension. Internally, we have the state, we have the internal, we have our internal assessment and alignment. I love about it how we're going to use it from an authorizer point of view. And I think uh, Mark. I'd answer my question. I'll take him on additional questions okay. later. On, so. You know, again, to, what you want to do is essentially what they call a deeper dive. So if Taylor Exemplar was looking at this, uh, I think there was one grade level. For example, uh, this one here, grade three, you can see they had good growth, but there was, and you know, there are different cohorts of students, but why is, what's, what was going on there? So then you'd look at your most recent cohort of students, and you'd probably go into your NWEA and start looking at, the difference. That's probably representative of three class. How many grade three students? Grade three classes. Three grade three. So then you look at that and you see if there's differences between the three grade threes, and then you look down to students. This isn't currently offering you that. This is definitely an authorizer tool. Uh, but as school leaders who are going to be talking to your school boards and having QPR or uh, Bay Mill staff, where's Pat Victor? Pat Victor coming to your board meetings talking about their analysis of your performance as school leaders, you want to be very familiar with how this works and how it reports out. Yes? How will the information about the Just as with the, it will, I'll be communicating it along with reminders that come about the epicenter. Yeah, again, this is, I, I'm not sure how, in some schools, the school leader is actually doing the loading of the data and the, uh, looking at the data and can look up reports. In other schools, it might be your, IT teacher or your uh, assessment. assessment coordinator. So it's different in each school. You, you can determine who, uh, who attends that. All right, great questions. Anything else? We're actually, we, we find them from one to three. So it's going to work out well. All right, very good. I'll hand it back over to you.